What's up to all my poetry lovers out there? It's your boy Ian, and I'm here today to talk about the origins of the sad boy and the sad girl and their relation to Rainer Marie Rilke, the great German poet. So, how is everybody doing doing today? Do you guys know what a sad boy or a sad girl is? It really is the evolution of the emo, goth, and indie kids and scene kids from, you know, the 2007 to 2013 era. Is that's transition now. It's the new term is sad boy and sad girl. And the dress, the mannerisms, the music, they've all changed. They've been a little bit muted, and now it's more widespread that there are a ton of sad boys and sad girls out there. Teen teenage depression, teenage suicide, all these different things have been increasing, and especially over the last two or three years. And depression has become an identity. But depression and this new thing, we could link it, though, to self-isolated consciousness, right? That these people, uh, these kids and adults are literate, right? They are smart, but they, are, they have the leisure time and the emotional and artistic capacity to dive into the layers of their consciousness and their soul. And instead of individuating out of that, instead, they hunker down in that persona and inflate their superego within that. And then, um, and, you know, and that creates a ton of problems, obviously. And if they are teenagers, there's a ton of people around them who are like, what the hell is happening? And because they aren't literate and have no emotional skills and probably have been helping these people repress them, helping their kids repress themselves, they immediately seek out a diagnosis, medication, all these other things, instead of trying to, you know, solve it through other means. And then that just continues to cycle more. Sad boys are also and sad girls are also known because of this persona. And we've talked about this so many times before to project and try to fix that problem, their depression with the beloved, right? And this is a term Rilke really brought out into modern literature, a, a beloved, a transcendental signifier uh, through of a human being. And then they fail because then they realize, and that's why they're so sad is that after they kind of have some sexual pleasure and release, they'll, Oh, I don't like you anymore. Who are you? I don't want to feel emotions. And, you know, this this is a huge problem right now for especially people under the age of 35 of all the artiste manques, all the suffering artists out here, all the misunderstood people who are creating havoc in the relationship world. And Rilke was the first one to do that. And he was like, he is the OG at so many levels. And as we go through this, you guys are going to, I was, I had my mind blown yesterday because I'm also working on a much more serious presentation that I'll, I will be releasing tomorrow called Rilke's Creative Genius, the 100 year anniversary. And, you know, because in 19, February, 1922, Rilke finished the Sonnets to Orpheus and the Duino Elegies in one month. And that is the ultimate fetish and fantasy of all the sad boys and sad girls out there that over a two-week period, over a three-week period, they're going to finish two monumental works that are going to elevate them into public consciousness, and they will finally be understood, and they will have money and um, everything else that they want, <laughs> and they will have an impact for a ton of time because they are too lazy and too depressed and too sad to actually put the work in for three decades to produce two works that are that good, so they just want to finish it in two weeks, right? And Rilke really, I mean, Rilke didn't maybe mean to do this, but that's what happened. So let's talk about some of the um, origin stories. First of all, in his book, Sonnets to Orpheus, he uses Orpheus, you know, the um, so quick backstory, Orpheus, the um, Greek figure, he's not a god. He marries Eurydice and he plays the lyre and he can tame wild beasts and move men's hearts. He marries Eurydice, she gets bitten by a snake, gets sent to hell or to the underworld. Orpheus travels down there and uses his lyre to... Ten, uh, tame Cerberus and he gets down there and he plays some songs for Hades about his longing and grief over Eurydice's, Eurydice's death and they say all right you can you can take her but you you have to walk up all the way back up to the top and you can't look back at her and when he gets to the very top um when he finally steps out of the underworld he looks back and she's still in the underworld and he looks back and then you know she gets swept back into the underworld and then he has a bunch of longing and grief, and he starts going around and playing the saddest music people have ever heard, and it makes them depressed. So he'll go around town to town, and he plays music that makes people depressed. Oh, wait. Has, has that ever been that like mentioned before that this character, because of loss and love and because of hardship, is um, <laughs> playing music that makes people depressed? And Rilke, if you're looking at his life, 
brought Orpheus back. He really popularized it and modernized it again. And this has had a huge artistic impact on the poetry world. So, but Orpheus understood that death is a complement to life, that this escapes the kind of the Christian worldview that when we die, we go to even a better place. We go to heaven. Rilke understood about the duality of life and death. So he is also an under, he was an unappreciated artist, right? Um, and a prick to his family. He spent all of his family savings. He left his wife when his daughter was really young and he just didn't do that. Like, okay, you, you, you're going to leave your family. Okay. Maybe you want to pursue this artistic vision, but he would ask them for money and cheat them out of stuff and be kind of a jerk to them and be abusive. Very typical, right? I know so many people out there and so many sad boys, and they're probably from mostly guys, really, from ages 20 to 40. And they are these artists, right? Mostly writers, but I know some artists, too, like actual artists, artists. And they have, a, they, are a, they have these addictions, they think, because you know other artists do drugs or um, drink alcohol. They have to do that. They have never released anything after a decade long of work. They don't believe in marketing they all they believe is that they are going to slowly work pitch work away at their work and one day it's going to make them famous and they string line odd jobs or like leech on to people leech on to people in relationships to help string them along and <laughs> if we look at Rilke's life that's what he was kind of doing he was leeching off of people he was um, being a prick to his family and to other people and th th you know that is the kind of the problem with the artiste van k thing that has happened and that's why i really appreciate the author tom robbins tom robbins is really really one of the only authors out there and i have a book review on the channel um on his book still life with woodpecker all of his books do not have the suffering artists or characters in it all of his books have like these really elevated characters who are happy and do all these things and there is none of that artistic artiste van k bs in there because we love that strife. We love the struggle of the artiste Van K because we feel like that too. A lot of us feel misunderstood and have had trauma and stuff in regards to being an artist or a writer or even just a critical thinker in this illiterate world. So, of course, though, if we're looking at all this, Rilke was a fascist and he thought that fascism can heal the world. And for like, okay. So, if we're looking at incels and sad boys, a lot of them have been, um, call themselves red pilled, right? And they think that um, they are the Ubermatch, that they are. So if we go down here, um, they are Nietzsche fans, right? They think that a bunch of, a couple strong people in society can, are, that's, all, that's all that's necessary, right? And this actually connects to the time of Rilke because as we talked about in my book, recent book review on P.S. Uspensky's The Psychology of Man's Possible Evolution, at that time, people were really interested in, in Nietzsche, including um dictators and stuff that you know the w dictators of world war ii and they thought that a couple of us through occultism or through just being smart or through power know what the hell is going on and everyone else doesn't the masses are illogical the masses don't know what's happening <laughs> so that's why it could heal the world that these authority figures these really strong people can do that and rilke threw his support behind mussolini before he died and so it's like this, I think, has a very similar tone that a lot of these artists, artiste man case now that I know are very radical in their politics. And they are honestly Bernie Sanders fans, or Bernie Sanders guy, Bernie bros or Trump bros, you know? And it's very interesting that most of the time being a poet, right? Being an artist, like for me, it, you transcend all that. When you understand poetry and emotions, you see how politics aren't real and how screwed up how screwed up it all is and you don't really it, it's very hard to take a political side when you don't really when you can transcend all barriers but Rilke got caught into the fascism trap and like I said a lot of sad boys and sad girls get are like of today have been caught in the Bernie Sanders trap or the Donald Trump trap and you might be like well why is that a trap because the only solution is an education solution everything else is a bandit until Almost all human beings, or at least enough human beings, have woken up and become nonviolent, educated, and can spread you know, charity and love to other people. The world will always suck. There will always be problems. There will always be um, the swing ebbs and flows in politics and problems and 
dictators or people abusing power. The only solution to end suffering is that every single human needs to become educated enough to at least become nonviolent. And <laughs> a lot of these, so if you, a Trump or Bernie bro, they are saying this guy will fix that. That's the problem. Bernie will fix all this. He will turn this he will turn this country into a Swedish place or Trump will, you know, do whatever he's going to do. And that is a huge problem because that as we're seeing now because we're seeing the pendulum swing. It's swinging and if you know things maybe go as planned it might swing back into another populist direction. In America, we've been functioning in populism basically since Barack Obama was elected. And now we've Thought that we've stabilized, but now with all the tumultuousness of what happened with um, in the last two years with the pandemic and now with the Ukraine, the, it's swinging back the other way. And <laughs> who knows what's going to happen? The, we're going to call, instead of fixing our own problems and instead of trying to educate others, we're going to call upon leaders and other people to do that for us. And that, has, as we've seen in history, always creates problems. So Rilke, sorry for the, the political rant. Hopefully a lot of you guys have um, stayed with me here. Rilke also believed that art over everything, you must change your life, that every single artistic work, that art must change your life. To be a real artist, you must change your whole life. And that's why he left his kids and his family. And Rilke is a success story because, you know, for looking at it, okay, he actually did. He wrote magnificent works. He wrote the Sonnets to Orpheus and the Duino Elegies and the Book of the Hours and all these other crazy poems. He actually had the, the he actually had it. He actually like was the person, but I know so many people who leave, um, destroy their family and destroy relationships and destroy their own life to chase some dumb dream. And they are not even putting in the work. They're not living. They're not walking the walk and real go walk the walk. That's what we can say that the whole time he was trying to produce poems. He was trying to do this. And after decades of work and decades of agonizing pain because of, a, um, at least a decade of as agonizing pain because of, um, d ailments, he produced these works. So he really had that mentality. But a lot of these guys, a lot of sad boys have this mentality. And this comes back down to selfishness. They have this very selfish mentality, but they never produce anything. They never actually do anything with that. It's really sad. Also, it's really funny that he loves the book, The Decline of the West, which is the ultimate, um, if we're looking at like the people who... Um, more on the right, they love that book. They love talking about this, the collapse of the Western civilization and the Western civilization's values. And once again, if we go back to the education solution, who cares about Western civilization doesn't exist? All this is just a facade. What we need to be focusing on is creating nonviolent and human beings who can communicate their emotions and not react to those. And once we can get there, then we can move on to curing cancer and doing all these other things and um, infrastructure plans. What does all that mean when we can't even, when a lot of people, like I was talking to some guy like two weeks ago and he, I felt like was a very, he's, he's a professor. So I was talking to a professor two weeks ago and, you know, in a candid, you know, conversation, social conversation. And I was talking about this and then I, and then he was kind of giving me some weird looks. So I was like, Hey man, if someone came up to you and like said like the worst possible thing to you. Like we were like, if I told you right now, like I said something really mean about your family and you and about your kids, what would you do? And he's like, I'd beat your ass. And after we had the conversation about the only solution is edge. And I was like, why do you care about what I think? Why does that matter? These are just, blah, blah, blah. I'm just making sounds out of my mouth and you're going to react and hurt me because of that. You haven't, how are we supposed to, <laughs> like I said, even professors, you know, people who are educated, like we have, we're supposed to solve this problem in kindergarten, keep your hands to yourself, but we haven't solved this problem because we make excuses for people. We make excuses for violence. And then we send people to prisons where it's a criminal university instead of actually healing their problems, instead of actually trying to rehabilitate them and teach them this, we just make them more violent. They live in a stressful and, and crappy place, which um, keeps them in base consciousness. It's a freaking problem, man. But a lot of... <laughs> This is a, such a big thing, right? Like people on the right talk about the collapse of Western civilization. It's not that hard to, you know, re reimagine society. It's not that hard to reimagine institutions. Okay. Slide number two. So sad boy. So he was a hypocrite. Rilke was a hypocritical elitist. Rilke believed that. And if we see down here, he ha hated the city. He hated poor people. He thought that they were dumb. And, um, 
really had a kind of lower view of them. But he also thought, so he had this elite view of society and how we're supposed to live. But then he also hated rich people because he thought they weren't embodying those, um, the values that elitists should, that the people at the top should, the superman or superwomen should be. And he also was a supporter of the rush. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. But that's kind of an odd view, right? That poor people suck and also rich people suck. That is the ultimate woe is me, depressed, sad boy view that like there's always something better that um, – and you really see this. So I, I should have mentioned this early, but like most sad boys are just really dumb and don't know what's happening. <laughs> just to be honest, right? But there's also this breed of sad boys that are very logical, right? They're atheists a lot of the time or like, you know, believe, you know, they exper- they're, um, they're very logical. They're very smart. They're very, they're pretty well read. And they kind of come to this viewpoint that like the world sucks. We can't change it. So we have to do it through logic. We have to do it through incremental changes. And like, like I was saying earlier, most of the time they're socialists or libertarians. That's kind of the two camps that they fall in. And what, you know, most socialists and libertarians have a very elitist view that like we can solve these problems that like, you know, if we implement these plans and get rid of these, these institutions, X, Y, and Z will happen. Or, 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 you know, if we do more control on the socialism side, with we have a few smart people in here and structure they structure society in a certain way, things will function better. So it's really – but then they believe, though, and the reason – they believe, though, the people in power now, that the elitists now are crappy, right, that they suck and that we need a re-augmentation of those people. Once again, another correlation to most sad boys and these types is that they are low-level occultists, that they aren't usually religious – but they aren't probably atheists. A lot of the time they're like into spirituality. And most of the time that's a front to, you know, get, you know, pick up some chicks or some dudes or something or to heal a little bit of trauma. But they're usually like low level occultists or like low level spirit, spirit, spiritists. And, you know, it's so funny because like I was making this presentation and I was reading about Rilke. I read a whole book about a biography of Rilke. And I was like, oh my God, like this guy sounds like the ultimate incel, the ultimate um, modern sad boy. <laughs> and if you look at his impact and about, you know, learning the internalization of the soul and the internal layers of the soul, that's what sad boys talk about, that they are more than just what they are, that there's this sad nature to them. So Rilke was a low level occultist. He was dabbling in the occult, dabbling in these things. And most of the time, it's, I've, when I've seen that sad boys, the goth, the emo people, you, you saw this. Like a lot of emo people, they have pentagrams or Satanists or whatever they call themselves. They are into the occult or these things. And that's because they believe in the transmute. They understand the transmutation of energy. They understand their emotions enough to understand that vibe, mindset, these things can transmute. And that's, you know, and that's, but they never transcend out of that low level occultism, out of selfishness into selflessness because. Real cultists understand that when one suffers, we all suffer. And if someone is suffering out there, then that's impacting you on a spiritual level so that you must cre- you must use s- spiritual energy, God, whatever, the, whatever, to turn yourself into a beacon of light, into a human who can create change, who can help. That's what I'm doing. That's what I've done with my 13 years of studying and practicing the occult and spirituality, that I am trying to use that power not to make myself better so that I can help others. And as you've seen, this is my 11th year in financial poverty, you know, and um, a lot of other things that that hasn't impacted me very well, but it has helped a lot of other people. And that's my goal that I look at this channel. I'm releasing courses for free. I don't, eventually there'll be monetary stuff, but monetize, monetize, monetize content. But I believe in the free, free model that it, if you understand what's happening, you need to do whatever you can to stop it. So I, I don't need to go into a tangent. He also believes in sexual supremacy. He believed that poor people should not understand the mat that it, it was a travesty that poor people understood the magic of sex, that, you know, sex is so great that it's so sad that poor people under could understand and cause they can't, they can't understand it. They can feel it, but he thought they couldn't understand it. He also believed in phallic supremacy of the man and how, um, 
phallic energy is what creates the world and logic and light, which, you know, is a very kind of sexist point of view, which, which once again kind of goes back to the sad boy and sad girl that they use their sex. They sexually exploit people all the time. I've seen this happen to so many people. I've watched guys do it. I've watched um, people I know have it done to them that these sad, depressed people, because they're in tap with their emotions. Because, okay, so you're, you're, let's talk about this from a female point of view. You, you're a female and you are in touch with your emotions, let's say. And then there's this group of guys out there. There's like the, we have the jocks, right? The, you know, just a bunch of douches. Okay, they're out. We then have, the ambitious guys, right? We that, Okay, then we have like just the day jobbers, right? The guys who just want to, you know, um, work nine to five, come home, drink beer, play video games, all right? And not in tune with their emotions. They're out. Then we have like the super ambitious guys. All right, okay, they're educated, they're cool, but they don't really have time. They don't have the presence that they want. All right. Then there's obviously the really cool people, the pe people who are like them, who are in, tap with their emo in touch with their emotions and want to connect and love but those people are, those guys are far and few between. And then there's the sad boys. The sad boys want to talk. They are in touch with their emotions. They want to get to know you, but they have all these freaking problems. And they're, as we call it, a fixer upper, right? Um, as I, um, men and women, honestly, but I would say, you know, not to generalize, but women, I would say more like a fixer upper project. And um, these guys are this fixer upper project and they think but they don't understand that these guys don't give an F about them. They don't care. They are just viewing, they, they, they view these girls as these, this beacon of healing. But then when they don't get healed, when their sad boy, sad boy, sad boy -ness isn't healed, then they lash out on these girls and um, physically abuse them, emotionally abuse them, verbally abuse them. It's actually a really sad thing. And I talk about this more in my um, relationship cycle video, which I just released yesterday. So, um, Rilke also believed in poetic supremacy, that he was channeling that in those three weeks when he wrote the Duino Elegies and the Sonnets to Orpheus, that he was channeling this poetic energy from God and that he brought it down and that he was granted that energy. It was his. And, you know, I believe that on some level that we need to tap into the ether and bring it down, but I don't believe that it's mine. I believe that everyone can tap into that. So Rilke also has this, I am the one mentality. I am the one artist. And that, um, like I said, that um, fuels this selfishness that we, we've seen this whole time. Like if we look at this whole presentation, underappreciated artists and prick, selfish, fastish, selfish, art over everything, selfish, the, loves, you know, these weird books, selfish, um, Nietzsche, selfish, hypocritical leaders, selfish, occultism, low level occultism, selfishness, hates the city, being selfish, not trying to help those people, um, phallic supremacy, selfish. Poetic supremacy, selfish. And then, of course, the radical politics that Rilke was into fascism, but he was also into leftism. He supported the Russian Revolution. He supported a bunch of other leftist movements. And it's actually kind of funny that uh, once he died, the left kind of threw him out because of his elitism and um, his, his you know, him being German, that they actually threw him out. But he was radical in the politics. And we talked about this before with the Bernie bros and the Trump bros, that these people usually, the sad boys of today, are usually um, radical in politics. So Rilke helped establish art, the internal art, the sad, depressed art that we have now, because that's what Orpheus, you know, at some level is. And, you know, um, I think in the Duino Elegies, he says that if we could see an angel for what they are, if we could see life for what it is, we would die, that we couldn't handle that. Um, Same with politics. People who think they know what's happening in the world, they've seen the poverty, they know these things. They think that if everyone saw this, if everyone had the emotions, that they would that they would understand. But all you have to do is elect me and do this and the lobbying and blah, blah, blah for us to fix that. Instead of fixing individuals, we are trying to fix systems. Individuals are the only way to fix our world. One by one, person by person, through online scalable education that reaches everyone in the world through the internet, is how we are going to save the world. So I just thought it was really funny that um, Rilke, and here's a photo of Rilke and his wife that he ended up leaving. I, um, she's not very happy, man. She's not looking very happy with him. So I just really wanted to make that comparison that I don't know. Let me know if you, there is someone else out there who embodied this mentality, especially early on pre-1950, more so than Rilke, of this archetype that we're seeing now with the sad boy and the sad girl mentality these depressed the depressed army of people out there now let me know who 
let me know what artists you know um because obviously in once media started once the tv came out that started escalating more once you know the the medium visual mediums but like in terms of poets and writers and i think rilke was the first earlier early adopter of this because he was a suffering artist he had physical pain he had mental pain he had emotional pain he had family trauma he had you know trauma with le having to leave his kids um being an underappreciated artist there was a lot happening and he really channeled that and did a lot with that but he also embodied some of the negative malignant physical or um emotional traits so let me know what you guys think subscribe to the channel if you guys enjoyed this video i'm going to be breaking down a bunch of other authors i didn't really mean to make this a psychological breakdown but i'm excited i'm going to do this to some other people too i had a good time and thanks for watching